Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to part two of our caregiving series on resilience today. My name is Alana Dillon. I'm an Education and Support Services Coordinator with Parkinson Society BC, and I'll be facilitating our webinar today. Before you, you will see our agenda for today. Uh, first up, we have a talk on building resilience in caregiving by Caitlin Rowland. And uh, following that talk, we have a talk on harnessing negative emotions done by Jolly on Hallows. And finally, we will end our presentations with a breakout discussion as well as a Q&A session. I'd now like to introduce our guest speakers. Um, Caitlin Rowland completed her PhD in 2012 at the University of British Columbia, which measured Parkinson's disease related changes to daily muscle activity and consequences for physical function. She is currently a research scientist at the Office of the Seniors Advocate and Institute on Aging and Lifelong um, Health. Her work has examined care needs and well being in Parkinson's disease, dementia, and caregivers. Caitlin is a certified yoga teacher and offers yoga classes to persons with Parkinson's disease, and her yoga classes are called Yoga Dopa. Overall, she aims to support independent living and reduce uh, distress and increase healthcare utilization in persons with Parkinson's disease, dementia, and their caregivers. And Jalian Hallows is an instructor, writer, speaker, and advocate for caregivers in, of Parkinson's disease. He resides in Burnaby, BC, and manages the blog A Parkinson's Life and a Caregiver's Roadmap. He also volunteers with Parkinson's Society British Columbia as part of the Speakers Bureau, providing talks pertaining to caregiving and Parkinson's disease in public and semi-public settings. So I would like to welcome both of you, um, Caitlin and Jalian. Thank you so much for joining us today and providing um, talks in our caregiving series. Um, I'd like to pass it over to Caitlin now so she can start her presentation. Hey, there we are. Um, so thank you all for being here today. Um, I want to just take um, some time this morning or this afternoon, sorry, to talk about this idea of resilience. And this is I'm going to build a little bit on the, the pieces um, that we talked about last week um, in this session. But first, I want to give you some space to maybe grab a pen and some paper or have something um, nearby if you want to jot things down. We're going to do a little bit of reflection on on resilience and some strategies to build resilience. And so. Sometimes for me, I find it's uh, it's uh, easier to to for things to land if I have an opportunity to write them down or think them through. So, um, just an invitation to to kind of do that if um, if you need to while I kind of set the set the stage. So, oh, we talked a little bit about. Oh, let me go. Um, last week we talked a little bit about this idea of health and well-being and and what that really means and. Um, it's really this balance. Health is really this balance related to, you know, the, the negative impacts, the burdens and the stresses that predict strain, and the, the positive impacts on health, the things like preparedness, good relationship quality, sense of meaning that provide a buffer against those, those negative pieces. So this idea that um, health is this, this balance of stressors and burdens and, and positives. And, and last week we focused on this idea of meaning and finding meaning. Um, in the caregiving experience as a coping strategy or a, or a positive um, aspect of health. And then this week we're going to build on that, thinking about these ideas of preparedness as well and um, talking a little bit about resilience. So just to you know reflect on on last week um, when we uh, when we talked about meaning and this idea that we cannot choose how our care recipients disease will progress we cannot choose how other people will behave or how other people will feel we can't choose how long things are going to last or how bad they're going to get or how much they're going to cost but we can have choices around our attitudes towards the everyday and so meaning is this idea, you know, we talked about how caregivers of people with Parkinson's can find, you know, a larger perspective to start to understand 
um, and relate to the the day-to-day -day experiences. So when we talked about meaning, we talked about three aspects of meaning. Recognizing the losses and, and finding the space to grieve. Um, and then using that to move forward in the idea of finding meaning in the day to day. And then also this idea of a broader perspective of the you know, philosophical or spiritual meanings of life. So today we're gonna narrow in this on, on this idea of resilience. And was, resilience is really um, this idea that we should be focusing on the one thing that we have control over. Resilient, thriving, and, and happy people really focus the majority of their energy, attention, and time on the one thing that we have control over. And all we have control over is who we are in the present moment. That's it. Has anyone tried to change someone else? And how successful has that been? Usually not so successful. So being resilient is really kind of turning the lens and looking at, well, how are we reacting in the situation? Um, and how can we make changes to, to our own actions and behaviors and emotions that, um, that can help change the situation and the way we perceive the situation? So, you know, how shall I best respond to this moment in the healthiest, most, in, most enlivened way? And resilience isn't just one thing. It's actually a process and also an outcome. So it's the doing, and it's also being resilient and having an outcome of resilience. It's this learned skill that varies over time. It's how we adapt in a healthy way to stress. It's how we recover or bounce back from a difficult situation. It's how we expand our capacity to grow from an experience or that idea of bouncing forward. So why do we wanna talk about resilience? Resilience really helps us access positive feelings. So things like gratitude, loving kindness towards yourself and to others, it helps to self-regulate our internal experience. So those thoughts and feelings and behaviors and helps us to nurture really strong relationships. But resilience is also multidimensional. So there are four aspects of resilience that work together to kind of work towards this state of being resilient. So when we're feeling physically resilient, we usually feel really strong with good stamina. And this usually translates to having enough energy during the day to keep up. Emotional resilience is really demonstrated when we can be flexible and adaptive to the situation. So all of these dimensions of resilience are interconnected. So for example, when we're feeling like we have enough physical energy, it often translates to feeling more positive about ourselves and our relationships. And then this in turn leads to feeling less stressed, less frustrated and less angry. Those are the things that really deplete our resources and um, results in this idea of lower resiliency. So, Resilient people look for the upside of a situation, even during the darkest times. So Nelson Mandela famously said that his 27 years in prison afforded him two great benefits. He had time to read and time to think. So that is an example of a resilient perspective. Another, another quote that I like about resilience is by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he wrote, the same world to different minds is a hell and a heaven. And so that idea that our perspective and what we make of situations um, can significantly influence how we feel and how we move forward. So, you know, it comes down to this idea that it's not as much about the circumstances, the secret to a happy, resilient life is really this idea of perspective and how we kind of turn the lens um, on ourselves and understand how we're reacting and, and engaging in, in different moments. So here is a, you know, a list of, a not an exhaustive list, but an example list of um, some characteristics of resilient folk. And so ultimately this boils down to resilient people know that they have control over themselves in the present moment. So they acknowledge that there are other risks, but also resilient people know where to ask for help. So we've talked about some of these um, characteristics last week in our discussion around meaning. 
we talked about taking control of how you feel and, and seek meaning from a situation. And this week I'm going to focus on um, number three, number four, and number five around resilience and building resilience. So this idea, we'll start with this idea of knowing and relying on your own strengths. And what does that mean? Because that's the, the, the first place we're gonna start. So resilient people lean into difficult moments from a position of strength and from where their strengths lie. And these strengths that you have can really help determine how to best approach a situation, a challenge or a stressor. And so there's a, a, a great website. I, if any of this material speaks to you, I encourage you to take a look. It's viacharacter.org. And um, you can do a, a survey of character strengths and it's a, a free self-assessment. It takes you know, 15 to 20 minutes to do. To go through and identify you know how you react to situations and and how you engage in different moments um, to help you identify some uh, qualities or, or strengths um, in yourself and to help you reflect on how to approach um, moments in a in a res from a sense of a place of resilience so this is a uh, you know a list of some of those uh, pieces of um, and characteristics of, of resilience. So when, you know, around virtue, um, around wisdom, thinking about creativity, curiosity, judgment, love of learning and perspective. Some people come from a place of, of more courage. So bravery, perseverance, honesty, and zest. Other people approach situations or contexts or challenges from a place of humanity, from love, and kindness, that openness, um, that social engagement. Other people approach things from, from a sense of um, that virtue of justice. So thinking about teamwork, thinking about fairness, leadership situation, um, the virtue of temp, uh, temperance, sorry. Um, when we kind of approach a situation and, and lean into our strengths around forgiveness, humility, prudence, and self-regulation. And this idea of transcendence, the appreciation of, of the excellence and the beauty in the world, gratitude, hope, humor, being playful and lighthearted, um, and also this kind of sense of meaning and sense of relationship and spirituality. And so I want you just to take, you know, maybe one or two minutes and look through this, um, this list and, and think about where um, you approach a situation from. You know, thinking about a, a challenging situation that you've had during, you know, during your daily life, during your, specifically during your, your caregiving experience and think about, you know, did I, did I approach that from, um, you know, sense of bravery and perseverance or did I inject humor to help us, um, uh, you know, engage and, and work through a challenge? Um, you know, was I, was I very critical and critically reflexive and open-minded of different situ or, um, different solutions and, and worked through it from, from that kind of virtue of wisdom and, and judgment. Um, so just take, you know, another, another minute and think about, you know, where, where do some of your strengths lie and really reflecting on, on that piece. And I think this helps us to understand um, why caregivers have such different care experiences um, because people um, engage differently in the world and not only as caregivers do we engage differently um, in the world but we likely also engage differently in the world than the, the person we're caring for and so understanding that you know when we are coming to a, a period of challenge um, or, a, or a stressor that we might have to look to each other's strengths um, to help to, to engage in, and move that forward. So I really encourage you to think about, you know, what, where some of this, um, these strengths lie. And thinking about, you know, one, some people can identify up to three 
um, of these kind of signature strengths of, of where your, your truth lies and, and where you, you know, your position of power is as you um, engage the world. And knowing that really helps you to react to situations and challenges in, 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 um, from, a, from a place of, of strength and positivity. So the other piece I want to um, have you reflect on around um, resilience is this idea of close, dependable relationships. And for me, I think about this, you know, if you were on a ship and it was going down, who would you want on your life raft with you? You know, who would you want to sing back up in your choir? Um, whatever analogy speaks to you. And in reality, you know, we really, as humans, we really need at least one good friend. Um, and so, you know, again, I want to take, you know, uh, maybe a minute or two to think about, I want you to think about who, who is that one or two or, or three people that you would fill your lifeboat with, um, you know, and these people need to be those that are truly there for you. And sometimes this can be challenging to really be honest with yourself. And also recognizing that this changes. And so when we're thinking about, you know, who are our close dependable relationships? Who are our one or two or three good friends um, in this moment of time? They're probably not the same people that were um, in this role you know, 10 years ago. Maybe you have some, or that will be in this role five, 10 years from now, or even a year from now. And so thinking about, you know, and these are some opportunities you can, you know, write these down if that, that resonates with you, thinking about who is that person or those couple of people that would you would want in your life raft with you. And knowing that, you know, when you build um, resilience as a, as a person, and you often put yourself in your own life raft, because when you have found your, you know, when you are in your own choir, when you are helping yourself, that, that's when um, your strengths uh, are truly evident. So, you know, knowing what your strengths are, knowing, you know, where your close dependable relationships are. And the other piece um, around resilience that I wanna spend a little bit more time on today is this idea of knowing where to turn for help and who to ask for help. So Jolion talked about this a little bit last week. He, he made a comment about, um, and Jolion, jump in if I misinterpreted this in any way, but mentioned that, you know, he did not want to rely on his family for help um, and, and kind of the, the pieces around the caregiving, but, you know, accessed Cecil and, and really leaned on the support group um, that he had for, you know, this, this piece around, around caregiving and, and support and help. And, and I think this is a really important distinction to have, you know, the people that you identified who may be in your life raft with you are people that support you. Whereas, you know, what I'm, what I'm asking you to think about now are people that support you in your caregiving role, which is still you. It's a role you play. It's, it's one aspect of you, but it, they can be very different. They can be the same, but they can be very different. And I think this really stems down to this idea of, of, care planning um, and so you know building building our life and our, our emotions and our reactions from a place of our own strengths so identifying those strengths knowing who we have good relationships and leaning on them for support and then the kind of the practical piece around okay what am I going to need for help what do I need for help today what am I need for help five years from now and what does that look like from a really structured planning perspective Making a, care, uh, sorry, making a care plan is building resilience and it's actually a self-care strategy. It helps you have conversations around, you know, you, what you want the future to look like, what types of supports you may need in your life, who may be there to help support you. What are the goals of, of your care? You know, do you want to still continue to travel? Do you want to stay at home? Do you want to engage in certain activities? How does that um, look like for you and the person that you're caring for. And this idea that, you know, we need to account for progression and unpredictability, because as we know, Parkinson's disease is a journey that we're all on, and it doesn't look the same uh, between different people. 
you know, when you have this idea of being prepared, um, it does free up some energy so that you can enjoy um, some of the moments that you're experiencing now. And it helps you to think about what's going to happen in different situations in different facilities. So when we think about this idea of, you know, advanced care planning or, or care planning, it's, it's really bestly done in advance. So now, before you really need it, jointly with the people most effective. So doing it with the, the um, people who you're going to ask for help, doing it with your, your care partner, um, care recipient. And it's a, just a reminder for you to have an important discussion together now, but also recognizing that, you know, these care plans really need to be flexible because Parkinson's is progressive and your care plan needs to reflect that, being adaptable. And that subtle and unpredictable change that can happen with the disease, um, with the disease can be frustrating. And so we need to recognize that our priorities and our situations may change. And it requires us to constantly revisit this idea of planning and preparedness. And so, you know, what does a care plan look like? What does it entail? And well, there are different aspects of, of care planning considering the level of care needed for bathing, dressing, shopping, eating, what is the medication schedule, is home care viable in your current situation, you know, can you come? Mm. Think what all of those um, different changes uh, may be. We talked a little bit last week about uh, case managers and getting a case manager. And so case managers, community PTs and OTs can really help provide expertise and they can help you plan for future care at home and then can guide you in some of the public and private um, funding options that are available to you. So not only do you need to think about what's happening at home, but you also need to think about what could happen in an acute care setting, both for routine and emergency situations. So having a plan ready, working, you know, with a nurse on a clear discharge plan, understanding that you may need to advocate in a hospital setting um, and that, you know, you may need to evolve your plans as, as the situation evolves. Asking questions when you're, when you're coming up with care plans, understanding diagnosis, Getting, getting written care instructions, you know, connecting with pharmacists and GPs around, you know, any of the, the um, situations that arise in a hospital. Um, and so not only thinking about the, the context in which you need to make different care plans, but also thinking about who you want involved in that care plan. And so, you know, a resilient approach to caring is really knowing what needs to be done and who to call for help. So who are your trusted advisors? Who are the family, friends, and those who you want to make decisions with? Um, you can think about them as your board of directors, right? Do you have regular meetings with these people, check in with these people? Um, you know, how can these people who are, you know, gonna make up your support team help you not only care for, for your loved one with Parkinson's disease, but actually help you take some time off and to care for yourself, right? Giving yourself lots of time to plan and make arrangements. Um, and how can you work with, you know, healthcare professionals, family, friends, um, and, and kind of create this, this support network in a very formal, um, structured way, you know, how are you organizing information, keeping track of your healthcare team, keeping track of appointments, activities, medication, insurance, you know, calendars, um, and you know, where all of those pieces of information lie and where they live. Does anyone else know where those pieces of information are? Um, do people on your care team know what your care plan is and how are they engaged in that? So, you know, uh, Approaching caregiving from a resilient perspective is really knowing what needs to be done and who to call on for help when you need. And so thinking about, you know, again, what is your, your um, where are your strengths? Who do you have in your life raft to support you? Um, and then 
who do you have to call on for help? What is the, the plan and the details that you've, you've thought about and worked out, um, the planning and the preparedness that you've done? And then who is engaged in that? Who can you rely on support for help? Um, and all of those things um, help you to um, enjoy, you know, the, the moments now and because you know that there are some of these pieces that have been taken care of. And it really comes to this idea of, um, you know, asking for, for help and knowing um, that it can be really challenging to ask for help and starting to set some, some framework for how you can approach um, asking for help and, and building resilience in your role. And so we're always told to, you know, put on our own oxygen mask on a plane before um, helping someone else and, and really thinking about that in a sense of, you know, creating healthy boundaries, really setting limits to encourage self-care, using your care team um, to support you, using the people in your life raft to support you socially and emotionally, evaluating your own abilities and time and really being realistic about what you can do. Because as much as we'd like to, we can't do everything. And once we kind of recognize that and acknowledge that, and then identify, you know, who we can lean on for support in those different areas, we create a healthier, more, more um, positive perspective. And so seeking help from other people doesn't take away your, your role as a caregiver. It may change some of the ways in which you provide care, but it also is caring for self. And so, you know, like our physical muscles, um, resilient muscles have to be built through practice. And so, you know, we can create exercises for our resilient muscles. Um, and so I, you know, I'm hoping to, to share some, some examples of, of ways in which we can build resilience. And knowing that you will have most success if you pick small actions and do them regularly, right? We don't, you know, jump into the 50 pound dumbbells, right? We start maybe with the two and a half and then the five and then the seven and a half and then the 10 and building our way up. And so, you know, I encourage you to take one thing away from, from this webinar series, whether it's to, you know, call and get a case manager or whether it's to, to do the, the via characteristics and identify a signature strength. Thinking about one, um, piece that um, may open up some positive change for you. And don't wait until next week to do it. Don't wait until Monday or Sunday. Do it today, do it tomorrow. You'll have the best results. We don't want to further ingrain some bad habits. Recognizing that we can only be responsible for ourselves in the present moment. So, you know, maybe today we, we lean into situations from a position of our strength and maybe tomorrow we forget and we start yelling instead. And that's okay because we have another day and another opportunity. Tell someone about some of the changes that you want to make in your life. Be accountable. This would be someone maybe in your life raft that you think um, you have a, a close dependable relationship with that you can trust and who can support you. And, you know, encourage your process in, in building these, these resilient uh, muscles, whether it's, you know, rewarding yourself or, or acknowledging your hard work um, and knowing that, you know, this is a process and it's a practice, you know, it's like brushing our teeth. It's not something that we can just be done with. It's something that we need to do constantly, ongoing, every day. Um, and so... Uh, you know, we can um, take some more time. We'll have breakout discussions after Jolion's talk. And, um, you know, I can uh, encourage you to think about, you know, talking with your group, um, your breakout group around that, you know, that one thing that, that may resonate with you from, from mine and, and Jolion's talk in, in, um, today and, and from last week. Uh, so thank you. With that, I will pass it back. Uh, All right, does everyone see this? Okay, um, let me just, uh, I'm just adjusting my window here. Okay, 
Last week, I did talk about my personal story about how my wife Sandra had Parkinson's and I became her caregiver, so I'm not going to dwell on that. But one of the things I did talk about was the three dimensions of caregiving. The physical, the, uh, the, the, which is the how-to, the structural, which is how you rearrange your personal environment to make the caregiving as, as, as le less risky as, as possible, and the emotional. In this session, I'm going to be talking about the emotional. Because when I first became a caregiver and I went online and I looked up information about caregiving, that's what I found is negative emotions, just a morass of people stuff suffering from negative, negative thoughts, the grief, despair, depression. And the idea behind negative emotions is that they're, they're bad for us. We, we want to get rid of them. They're, they're, they're just, we, we cannot have negative emotions. If, you, if you're angry, go for a power walk, yell and scream, chop wood. That's a favorite uh, recommendation. I haven't figured out how that works if you live in a downtown condo, but there you go. Um, the, um, the whole idea is that negative emotions are bad for us. So we need to find the trash can. Oops, how did that happen? I pressed the wrong button, sorry about that. We need to find the trash can and dump the negative emotions into it. Get rid of them. But I have a vexing question. Why do we have negative emotions? I mean, we are all the product of a billion years of evolution. Every characteristic we have, physical, emotional, mental, we have because they served us, or at least they served our ancestors. They're beneficial. If, if you don't believe in evolution, then why did whatever deity created you give you negative emotions? We have them for a reason. It's like pain. Nobody likes pain. But, and there are some people who are chronically incapable of feeling pain, and unfortunately, they don't last long because negative emotions are telling us something. So the whole idea is that negative emotions are on our side. They might feel bad, but they are, they're serving us in some way. And the idea is not to get rid of them, but to harness them. To put them to work for us. Let me go on a <coughs> brief a definition here. An emotion uh, is an involuntary, instantaneous, subconscious response to an event or situation that affects us. We have no control over it. If, if I'm walking along a, a trail in the woods and a bear rears up in front of me, I do not think, oh, bear, I, I, I should have an emotion. What should I feel? Anger, frustration, fear, fear. That's it. I'll feel fear. It doesn't work that way. The emotion is instantaneous. And it's a response to an event that affects us. If I'm driving along the road and all of a sudden flashing lights appear in my rearview mirror, I will feel a spasm of fear or anxiety. If I see the same flashing lights on the other side of the street, I might check my speed, but I don't have the emotion because it doesn't affect me. So e e emotions are involuntary, instantaneous, and subconscious. Now, I've heard people say, you know, I really shouldn't be feeling like this. That's, that's silly. You don't have any choice. You, don't, you, you cannot choose your emotions. So to just, the word should does not apply to emotions. It's... it's it's, it's just something that happens. The word should applies to actions. What do you do? But you have no control over what emotions you feel. You have control over how you deal with them, and, and, and Caitlin talked about that. But you don't have any control about the onset of the emotion itself. The other thing about emotions is that they don't tell us why they're there. They don't tell us what the problem is. All they say, all they're saying is, hey, problem. It's an alert. Something's happening. Imagine, if you will, a, 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 a primitive hunter-gatherer walking across a savanna armed with this, only with a spear, and out of the corner of his eye, he sees a bush move, and he feels fear. 
what is it? Is it prey, something he could hunt? Is it a predator, something he needs to run from? Or just a random puff of wind? The emotion doesn't tell him. All it says is, hey, something's going on. It's up to his reason, his mind, to figure out what the problem is. So when we have a negative emotion, it's up to us to figure out why. Now, some of you may be saying, well, this is silly because uh, obviously, I'm, I'm, obviously I have this emotion because I'm in this lousy situation. But here's the problem. If you have a group of two or more people in the same situation, they will not have the same emotional response. So your emotional response is a combination of the situation and you. So the, the harnessing negative emotions means figuring out what's going on here for you. And here's the steps. You have a negative emotion. The first thing to, to do about it is analyze it. What's, what's going on? Why am I feeling this way? Remember, you might think, well, it's obvious, but I'm suggesting to you that it's not. That different people will respond differently. So you need to figure out what's going on here. Then do something about it. And, and I'll be talking about the things to do a little later on. And once you've done that, once you've addressed the emotion, it can relax. It's done its job. It's warned you of something and you've, you've taken care of it. So harnessing a negative emotion means analyzing, then acting. So the first step is to accept the emotion. It's not an enemy. It, it's, it's a part of you and it's telling you something. It's an alert. It's on your side. So then once you've accepted it, once you've said, okay, now, now how do I figure out what this is? You need to analyze it. And the, what I'm going to talk about here is two different categories of emotion. One is the spurs to action. The spurs to action are those emotions that compel us to do something. Uh, that, to, whether it's to scream or, or to lash out or to go for a power walk. We're charged with energy. We have to do something. These are emotions like rage, hate, anger, frustration. We have to do something. The other emotions are um, thieves of ambition. These are the ones where you just want to crawl into a corner, pull a blanket over yourself, and hope the world goes away. Grief, despair, guilt, depression. So what? emotion are you experiencing? There is one other emotion that doesn't fall neatly into these categories, or more properly, it falls into both, and that is fear. Fear can be a, a spur to action, getting you to do something, or it can be a thief of ambition in, in the sense that, oh, I'll worry about that tomorrow. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna focus on this now. So in this, in this session, what I'm going to be talking about is a, a couple of I don't have time to do all of the, the, the emotions I've talked about, but I will talk, give a couple of examples from each of these to illustrate what I mean by harnessing negative emotions. Now let's talk, let's start with fear. Um, an example, when my wife was had, had Parkinson's and she was getting worse because Parkinson's is progressive, I, I, I dreaded the day when I could no longer look after her. And at that, I would have to put her into a care home. And that just, that, that filled me with dread. I mean, I, how is she going to react? Is she going to feel that I betrayed her? Uh, how, do I, how, do I, how do I remain part of her life? Uh, and the care homes themselves, where are they? How do I register? What do they cost? Uh, how, how do I get on the list? All of these sorts of things that I didn't know. And it, it created a fear in me. And I kept asking myself all of these questions, which is kind of dumb because I was asking someone who didn't have the answers. So I, I the, here's, the, here's the thought. Ask someone who does have the answers. Ask a social worker or a case manager or a doctor and create a plan. 
this is what I will do. And, and Caitlin talked about creating a care plan. Create a plan. What's going to happen? If, if my wife reaches the point where I can't look after her anymore, here is the plan. And at that point, the fear was gone. There were other, there were other problems and issues that I had to deal with, but the fear had done its job of spurring me to create a plan. All right, let me talk about the, but that's what I mean about harnessing an emotion, putting it to work for you, not, not avoiding it, not shoving it to one side. And by the way, just let me comment here that when people say negative emotions are bad for you, in the long term they are. Long term emotional distress can cause digestive problems, high blood pressure, all sorts of physical, uh, physical conditions. So you, you do want to get rid of them but you want to get rid of them by using them, not by throwing them away or, or ignoring them. So let's talk about the spurs to action. Hate, rage, frustration, and anger. And in this session, I'm going to talk about frustration and anger. So what's the difference between them? In many, in many cases, they feel the same, but there are, there's an important difference. Frustration is triggered by a problem, typically an ongoing problem, something that happens again and again and again, and you just can't get, you can't solve it, and it's, it's just driving you up the wall. But it's fleeting. Once the problem has passed, the emotion disappears. You're no longer frustrated. Anger is triggered by an entity, a person, an organization, a policy, and it's persistent. No matter what happens, you're still angry. So let me deal with um, frustration first. What do I mean by harnessing frustration? Let me give you an example. I would, um, I, when I would transfer my wife to a wheelchair, I'd put down the foot pads and I'd say, okay, feet on the foot pads, nothing. Put your feet on the foot pads, nothing. Sandra, put your feet on the foot pads, nothing. Well, after repeating this a few times with a few choice adjectives, I was getting frustrated. Now this might seem like a small, small deal. It's, it's what's the big deal, right? But caregiving is composed of, of, an, of a collection, of an amalgam of small frustrating issues. And if you can get rid of them, if you can, can set them aside, your caregiving journey will be that much, much that, that much more comfortable. So I, I, one day I happened to mention to my doctor, um, I, I, I can't get my wife to put her feet on the foot pad. What's going on here? And he said, well, the Parkinson's disease has severed the part of her brain that has the intent to carry out an action from the part of her brain that actually carries it out. She thinks she is putting her feet on the foot pads. So if she doesn't, you do it for her. And in that instant, I suddenly realized that the problem was not that, my, that she wouldn't put her feet on the foot pads. The problem was my desire that she should. I wanted her to remain, I wanted her to be as independent as possible. I wanted her to do things for herself and she couldn't. And, and that to me was the frustration. So if you're facing frustr frustration, a, a situation that, that you haven't, uh, that, that you, you can't solve, here are some questions, and I suggest you walk through these with, with, with someone else because you haven't solved the problem. That's why it's still a problem. That's why you're still frustrated. You haven't solved it. So you need help to work, to work through it. So here's some questions. What is the problem? In my case, my wife wouldn't put her feet on the footpads. Why is that a problem? Well, you know, she might, she might, uh, injure herself if her feet aren't on the footpath if they're dragging on the ground. By the way, this question, why is that a problem, is an important one. Um, one of the things that, that my wife took to doing, well, one of the things that happened was that she would drool. And particularly, she was eating or drinking, she would drool. And it, it created a mess on her, on her blouse, on her sweater. Um, and, but it, it, it wasn't frustrating. I, I, 
I realized there was nothing I could do about it. And besides, that, that's what washing machines are for. But it occurred to me that other people might be distressed by seeing this. And I thought to myself, well, if so, that's their problem. I'm that it's up to them to worry about that. I'm not going to take on their problem. So why is it a problem? Well, in the case of the, in the case of the foot pads, she could injure herself. Is there another solution? Well, yeah, I could put her feet on the foot pads myself. Why aren't you doing it? Well, because I want her to be independent. Ah, could that be the problem? Oh, so, so by going through these questions, you 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 can in many cases come to uh, the come to the recognition that the problem is not what you thought it was. It's something quite different. In my case, it wasn't the foot pads. It was my expectation. Sometimes this doesn't work. If you get frustrated in the traffic, uh, the problem is the traffic, and it's there's nothing to be done about it except maybe go out when there's less traffic but but in many cases you will find that this works to harness frustration and once you've done that your frustration can relax it's done its job so let's turn to anger um there's three different types of anger i'm not going to talk about them all um Entity-based anger is anger at a person or an organization or a policy for something they have done. Misplaced anger, which uh, is anger at the, uh, the, the, the unions or the oil companies or, or you know, some, some entity that really has nothing to do with, with your problem. You're angry at something and you've redirected your anger to that. I, I won't discuss this because time constraints. And the third things generalized anger where we talk about when people are angry at the system or the disease or even God um, and I'll be talking about generalized generalized emotion when I talk about despair but what I want to deal with here is um, anger at a person or organization anger at an entity and I'll give two examples one uh, I, I, I had heard of a, a doctor who was really good with Parkinson's and I wanted my wife to see him, but my GP wouldn't give a referral. And when I asked him why not, he said, he, he doesn't take new patients. Uh, I, I've tried to make referrals before, he always turns them down. So I said, well, at least try, at least make the referral. No, he said, it's not, it's not worth it. And I was angry at him for not even trying. The second example is that the home care organization that I worked with came up with a policy that said care aides could no longer give medications to the carees. And when I had care aides come in, if I had to be away at a meeting or something, um, the, uh, the, they would give the medications. Well, they couldn't anymore. And so I, I was angry at the organization for this policy. So how do you deal, how do you harness the kind of anger the first thing you need is, need is to define who is the target, a person. You need a person. In the case of the doctor, the person obviously was the doctor. He was the target. In the case of the home care organization, who, who, who stands in for that organization? Well, it was the case manager. Now, I wasn't angry at the case manager. She didn't like the policy either. But you need some person, an individual, to stand in for the target. Second question, can the target fix the problem? Not will they, are they able to? Is it within their ability? If so, then negotiate. Prepare your arguments and, uh, uh, and strip them of all their emotional context and discuss them with, with, um, uh, with a friend, go through them and practice them and then, then negotiate with, with the person. If you can change their minds, the problem is fixed. If you can't, and the person still won't respond, then it's in the same position as whether or not the target can fix the problem. Can't and won't here mean the same thing. In which case, you need a workaround. The workaround in my case for the, for the referral was, I, I, 
my wife had another doctor and, and I asked her, would she do a referral? And I was all ready to go in there and, and try to persuade her. And she said, sure, I'll do the referral. <laughs> End of problem. The workaround for the, the uh, uh, medications was a bit more complex because I had to adjust my schedule so that I'd be, be away when she didn't need medications. That didn't always work. So sometimes I'd, have, I'd give the medications early before I left, sometimes late when I came home which isn't ideal, but it's better than nothing at all. And if I had to be all away all day at a client's office or at a seminar, um, then I'd hire someone from a private care agency to come in because they, they didn't have the restrictions. More expensive, but it solved the problem and it changed my anger from the, the, the care to the care home from anger to contempt, which I can deal with. Let me talk about the thieves of ambition. Grief, apathy, depression, guilt, despair. And I'm going to talk here about despair. Despair can be, um, can be triggered by the same um, triggers as frustration or anger. For example, take the, the feet on the footpads thing. My response was frustration, but it could just as easily have been despair. Why won't you do this? What's going on here? Why does nothing ever work out? The same thing with the anger towards um, the uh, the home care agency. It it could instead of anger, it could have been despair. Well, is is nobody on my side? Do I have to fight every, every battle by myself? So the way to deal with those kinds of despair is the same way that you deal with with frustration and anger. The same process that I just talked about. But what I want to talk about here is generalized despair. And as my wife progressed in her condition, I was getting more and more despairing. And I realized that we had expectations. We had expectations of our, of our retirement. We were going to be uh, traveling, we're engaging with our community, growing old, just holding on to one another. That was the expectation. The reality was quite different. And there was a gap between the expectations and the reality. And my despair was because of that gap. That it was nothing like, a, the, the, the world I was living was nothing like what I had expected. So how do you deal with that? Well, you eliminate the gap. Eliminate the gap so that your expectations align with reality. How do you do that? Well, here's, here's the process. Um, sorry, I, I should have advanced this slide a little earlier to illustrate the gap between expectations and reality. Here's the process. You have your expectations. They no longer apply. You've got to discard them and replace them with, you've got to get rid of them. How do you get rid of expectations? Well, it's actually not that hard. We've all been doing it all our lives. I'll be willing to bet that the life you lived when you were 40 was quite different from the life you expected to be living when you were 20. And when you were 60, different still. It, we, we, we get rid of, of, reality throws things at us and we have to change our expectations. How do you react when you lose your job and have to move to another city to find another one? Or uh, you get a lucrative job offer in, in a far off country and you have to uproot your family. Or you discover that your wife, your, your, your spouse, and you can't have children. What do you do? How do you adjust, the, how do you discard the old expectations and replace them with new ones? Well, this is something we've been doing all our lives. It's not a new process. So you need to replace them with new expectations. But what? What kind of expectations can you possibly have? Well. One of them is to live your life as fully as you can. You still have a life and you still need to lead to, to live it the best that you can. I talked about this last week, looking after yourself and Caitlin talked about it in, in, in her, in her uh, talks that you need to look after yourself. So how do we do this? So ask yourself, what, 
what what do I want that is realistic? What do I want in terms of, of, um, of my life? How do I want how do I want to live it? Given the constraints that I'm under, um, what's my passion? And then find ways to make it happen. Get yourself a, you know, a care aids to come in in the evening so that you can take that course in ceramics or um, uh, Cantonese. Um, go go uh, put your, your spouse or your carry in a, in a day program so that you can, uh, you can go golfing or have lunch with a friend. Arrange for respite care for your carry so that you can attend that hang gliding jamboree or the, uh, the writer's conference. You need to create a life for yourself that has its own expectations and expectations that you can handle. Once you've done that, the, the, when, when the expectations align more closely with reality, the despair vanishes and you can live, it, it's done its job. It's done its job in helping you, in helping you move on to expectations that, that you can handle, that you can work with. Now I want to talk about briefly about two other emotions here um, before I close. Um, rage and depression. Both of these, rage and depression, by definition, are emotions that you cannot control. Anger we can control. I may be angry, but I can do something about it. I may be angry at the jerk who cuts me off in traffic, but I don't ram my car into his in anger. I, I might be, uh, I, I may be despairing about some policy that some organization has come in, but, but I don't collapse into a heap on the floor. Most of the emotions we deal with, we can handle. But these two, emotion and depression, they're beyond uh, emotions. They're more like clinical conditions and they need treatment. They need to be looked after. The problem is that by definition, you can't. You can't look after them. So here's my suggestion. You need an early warning sentinel. You recruit someone close to you, someone who cares about you, someone whom you see often, and you say, I want you to keep an eye on me. If you see me sliding into, into rages and, and threatening and, and smashing things, or if you see me sliding into a condition where I'm slovenly and not looking after myself, not eating, if you see either of these things, I want you to call my doctor. Here's his number. You don't ask them to intervene. That's not, they, they wouldn't know how, but yeah, you call your doctor. You talk to your doctor, you tell him what you're doing, and say, I will sign any papers you need right now to authorize you to do whatever treatment you need. That way you're covered. Now, most of us will never need this. Most of us, we deal with it. We, we are, you are, incredibly strong. You're going to, you're going to get through this. Uh, and, and you will not, most of you will not succumb to, to rage or depression. Anger, and dis, anger or despair, yes, but not the uncontrollable forms. But with the early warning sentinel, if you do, there will be someone there to catch you. Now I've I've talked I've talked very briefly uh, about this. I have a more thorough description of this in a document that I've written called Harnessing Negative Emotions. It's on my website www.aparkinsonslife.com, and uh, you can download it. It's free, and I don't ask you to sign up for anything or need your email address, so you can download it and, and uh, it's available to you. I hope this has been useful, and I, I thank you. I thank you for your your participation and I, and I thank you I thank you for for the work that you do and for caring for the, for the people you care for so again thank you